460, page number 460. You can keep your seats on this one. Let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing one more, page 255. Before we sing, Dad wanted me to make one announcement. Uh, next week, Monday, Tuesday night, um, Brown Summit Baptist Church is having revival with Brother David Elps. Epps. I'm sorry, David Epps. Um, Dad is going Monday night. He said if we can get a group to go uh, with him this coming Monday night at 7 o'clock at uh, Brown Summit Baptist Church. Be sure and let him know if you'd like to go along with him on that. All right? Page 255, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a prayer. Father, thank you that you love us. We thank you for this opportunity to come to your house tonight and to um, worship you, to think about you, to think of your good deeds that you've done among us, Lord, the work of these two pastors here, Lord. We pray you'll continue to bless them, their work, their efforts, their time, trying to reach people for Christ. And Lord, we pray tonight that our hearts might be spoken to and challenged as we hear what they have to say as well. Lord, we just pray that you'll work in our hearts and lives in a very special way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
Well, Brother Mark Logan is going to be with us, and he's going to come and introduce our pastor. And uh, his dear wife, Pat. Now, Pat's short for Pat's name, and I told uh, Mr. Catasack. Yes, yes. Praise God. We're just going to call him Kevin, okay? <laughs> just make it a little easier for us. But anyway, it's good to have them. He's going to give his testimony in just a minute, and uh, Brother Mark is going to you, 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 say a few words for you. Introduce them. I'm sorry. I took, I took your word. Brother Mark had a hard time getting here tonight. <laughs> he was supposed to be here at 6. And that old GPS, I think the devil owns those things. And uh, it took you, what, 40 minutes to get yeah, here. Yeah, I've been all around Greensboro tonight. Today. Yeah. No, I don't want to waste your time on that. Uh, but I was in Pakistan until just last week. And did, we're, uh, did I tell you that um, they closed the airport at, at Lahore for five days? Uh, what happened was India and Pakistan are constantly at, not war, but... A dispute over the Kashmir. So the, there was a big bombing about um, two weeks before I got there, and um, uh, a bunch of suicide bombers blew up over 40 people on the Indian side. And of course, it was came from Pakistan, so that ignited the furor. So India sent a fighter jet in to bomb uh, Pakistan, you know, just about 50, 60 miles maybe from north of the city of Lahore where, where, where I minister. And uh, so, and I was there, and, and, um, and so they shot down the fighter jet. That was while I was there. Well, they killed the one pilot, they captured the other pilot. It made national news, but, you know, because we're so focused on you-know-who and uh, anything that he might sneeze or do, you know, um, it doesn't, nothing much international <laughs> breaks through, you know, if you know what I mean, the, the major network. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but um, so anyway, but that's what happened. And so it was kind of unprecedented. Uh, Lahore is a city of 16 million, and they closed the airport for five days. And I was due to fly out um, at that time. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to get out. And I called my travel agent. She said, no, because they closed the airport, the, the, it'll take you four or five more days to be able to get a ticket out of there. So I had churches pray. Uh, you know, my wife, I, I, you know, just different people. Um, and, and, you know, the Lord opened a door for um, uh, the airport to open up the night before I was to leave. So I didn't have to reissue, have a reissued ticket. And I was able to get out. Boy, I was really glad uh, to be leaving. I mean, I, I love to, to be in these places, but it's nice when you think, uh, you know, that the Lord's intervene allow you to be able to get out of a, a place. Um, but there it is really a lot of trouble over there still. So, um, but I got out and then I came back home a week ago tonight. And um, uh, my friend, uh, Kiatasak Sirapanadorn. Can you say that real quick? Kiatasak Sirapanadorn. Yeah. It just rolls right off your tongue. Um, but Kiatasak and Pat uh, had come over from Thailand to attend a missions conference and, and several other churches. And so um, they, uh, they were here. And so uh, I took them up to where we live in Asheville. And, and we'd been to a few churches. And, and I called you before I went to Pakistan and said, you know, can we come? And so pastor said, yes, please come and, and, and for me to share about my, my ministry there in Pakistan. But I also have the privilege um, uh, several times over the years of going to be with Kiatasak, who's a pastor in Bangkok, Thailand. He's going to give a testimony here in a minute of his salvation. And do you want him to do that now or did you have other? OK, Kiatasak's coming. And, um, uh, and, and so I met him several years ago and, and we both have a, he has a tremendous burden. I'm just helping him a little bit. Uh, for mountain tribes way up on the borders of Myanmar, Laos, uh, China. And uh, so whenever I go there, I meet him in Bangkok and we fly right up to the border. I mean, almost some of our meetings, you can even throw a stone and probably hit the border. We're that close. And the pastors come over uh, from those countries where they're not at liberty to preach the gospel. In fact, some of the Laotian pastors spend time in jail. And so, and we minister to them. He ministers every month or two. And I just go over every so often to, um, to teach the pastors and, and be a blessing. And, 
And uh, so, Katasak, if you will, come and, and tell the folks um, uh, what's on your heart about how you came to know the Lord and your work over there. And uh, just um, uh, thank, thank God for you and that I can be a little bit of a, a blessing and help when I can. Good evening, and thank you to Dr. Roland Shipley. I'm right in, okay, for your offer or for you let me to stand where you, or you should be here. Okay, thank the Lord. Um, I came from the land with 66 million people and the ministry that God using us in Bangkok, that's in the capital city of Thailand with 12 million. So I got saved December 1968. December 4, 1968. Okay, before I came to know the Lord, I was born in the Buddhist family. Okay, I always using the word, I try to, to justify what do you mean fanatic? Okay, that means not only say, I'm a Buddhist, but in my home, Buddhist with the practicing. All kind of the, the regions believe that they should do. Okay, the question is, okay, I was, a, uh, why we did that? Because everybody, you know, even the Buddhists, they like, they like to go to heaven. Sure. They, they, they believe in hell. But because of my, I was born as uh, the promise, as my mother made to the Buddha. When I reach to the age of 21, I must be a Buddhist priest, not monk, but priest. I said, why? She believed that if I did that for her, it will be helping her to go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I still doubt, even I'm not really, that's what she said. Okay, so she made that kind of promise. 1967, first time in my life that I heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you might say, wow, it's a good. It's not good for me. <laughs> because of being a Thai, must be a Buddhist. We are very proud of ourselves. I sit down and learn English. Okay, that's what I would like to know. If I know English, I could make a lot of money. Everybody needs money. After I listen to what the missionaries tell us about God, His love, and he came, he would like to save us from sin and give us the answer of the way to go to heaven. John 3.16. <laughs> the word from John 3.16, the two words there, the word say, Whosoever believeth in him, in Jesus Christ, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So the question to me is, okay, whosoever believes in him, my question is, who he is? Why he has authority to forgive a sinner from sin and that we could go to heaven? For me, after that, I said, wow, this is what I have been seeking for, the answer as a Buddhist. So finally, I, that's December 4 at the uh, first youth camp. It's only few of us, only two who are not, who are a Buddhist and attend the, the camp. I one of those number I got saved. Amen. I never found peace in life. When I met the Lord Jesus Christ, I opened my heart and I pray, I accepted him. That's the answer, P 
peace in my life. And that peace still in my life because Jesus Christ is our peace. He's the answer of life. So I came back home. I have no doubt about who Jesus Christ is. I believe that no one else is God. It's only Jesus Christ. I told my mother, Mom, I found the answer of life. It's not me. I cannot save you. You and I, we have the same as a sinner. How the sinner could help the sinner? It brings me back to what I really to, like to get the answer of life from what I, we believe in the Buddha. When I come to the point of, okay, in school, you know, teaching about the Buddha, okay, he, his dad would like him to be a king, but he denied, okay? And he said, he's, going to, he's a seeking for the light of life, okay? That means, it, I, that means Buddha is not the light, He's seeking for the light of light. Why I should follow? After I told my mom, I found the true light. That's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is she happy about that? No. She said, get out from home. Okay? She never speak to me for 14 years. Okay, thank God. Okay? I prepare myself to help my dad to do business. I told him that I'm a pastor. Okay? After I done with my Bible college, I came back. I said, Dad, I will not do the business for you, but I have the business from the Lord for me to do for him. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I thank God. My home church called me to be a pastor. Okay. Started the work in Bangkok, 1978. The challenge is how we could get the Thai people in Bangkok. Remember, 97% are Buddhist. 3% are Muslim. Today, as we try to say, but what, how many Thai came to know the Lord? 0.5 percent. Okay, 12 years in Bangkok during the pastoring of Great Baptist Church. Okay, we thank God. God has been blessed, the church. And another three, four sister churches established in Bangkok. Okay, now for me is, we might have the same gift, calling. Okay, God's calling me to serve the Lord as a pastor. But I said, may, just be a pastor, maybe it's not enough for me. So I said, I need to do something for him more. So that's the beginning of reaching out to the hill tribes, Chiang Rai in Thailand, 1992. Okay, we thank God, God had been using us, reaching out to the hill tribes. Okay? The hill tribe is not Buddhist. Okay? The hill tribe is to believe in the demon spirit. My home, before I came to know the Lord, we practice both Buddhist belief and also demon spirit. We thank God in those years, God had been reaching to those people, and they come to know the Lord, God has been blessed them. Amen. More than 30 churches Amen. in Chiang Rai Good. and Chiang Mai. Good. The thing also came to my thought, if we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon, what are we going to do? Sitting down and wait for him to come? No. I was challenged, if we would like to see the Lord's work go fast, 
Okay? No way to go fast by one person. It should be trained more people. Okay? We started to train the hill tribes that they could work and they could be with their own people. I believe that they could do better than me. So we thank God. God has been blessed us. That's how, because of this ministry, God brought uh, Barry Scheller and Mark Logan to us. We never know each other. But God has been brought the person who have the same burden to train the national and let the national reach their own people. We step to the end of the world. I never thought about, you know, what it mean the end of the world? I believe that it should be on the border of each country. Okay? So God brought the people, come and we train them. After we send, train them, we send them back. We thank God. God has been blessed in those areas. Thai border, Laos border, Burma border, and China border. Before it was conquered by communists, mm-hmm. and then drug, heroin drug. But today, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has been to those areas. In the past four years, God has been blessed with eight churches. Okay, so pray for us. Pray that God will use this kind of method, reaching to the people. And also pray for me, okay? and pray for, okay, Mark visited us. That's why we get to know him. Okay. Since at least about five or six years, okay. even I thought of, Mark, why not move to Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> because I really need this kind of person who really built the national to do the work. Okay, thank you very much. I could tell you a whole night about my story. Okay, pray for Thailand, okay? That God will save them, the hill tribes, that we will see them in heaven. Today, I could believe that one day when we get into heaven, you will know them. And you will hear said, Lord, thank you for Charlie Baptist Church for all of your prayers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiarasak. Uh, did you need, uh, did I interrupt you? Did you have some other things before I come to do? Okay, I'm ready. Uh, I'll use this. No, I'll just use this. Yep, I'll be fine. We're kind of playing this by ear, aren't we? <laughs> it's going well. No, I'll just use this. No, no, this will be good. And uh, the fellows back there have set me up to show some pictures. Uh, some of these I just took the last uh, week or two. And uh, so... Um, but I thank God for Kiatasak and, and uh, work with some wonderful people around the world that are, are committed to training national leaders to go over. You know, he's got two guys named Jati and, and Luby, uh, who, whom, whom he has poured his life into. And those guys are strong pastors. And, you know, they go, they get on a motorcycle and go into these countries that I can't go into crossing those borders. And even Kiatasak has trouble because there's... there's uh, there's conflict there in that part of the world. So, uh, you know, th- when we train uh, national leaders, they can do the work that we, we cannot do, even if we wanted to. So um, I, I've been just in the United Arab Emirates, and, and I do want to uh, get my Bible. I didn't bring it up here with me because I want to refer to a couple verses. Um, okay, um, and, I, and they tell me all I have to do is press this button here, and let's see. Ah. Yes. Um, Abu Dhabi, if I flew into Abu Dhabi, what I didn't know a month ago is that uh, I flew in three days after Pope Francis had been there. Uh, and he flew out at the same airport, Abu Dhabi. What was he doing there? Well, he was there to, he was the first pope to ever visit the Arabian Peninsula ever in history. He was there to bring Islam and Roman Catholicism together. And I know you preach about the book of Revelation, things like that, Revelation 17. Um, Folks, we are very close to the coming of Jesus Christ. When world religion is getting together and world government is getting together, 
But we are so close to getting out of here, according to what the Word of God has to say. So Pope Francis was there, and let me just read you his quotes as he left the country. Uh, He said of the United Arab Emirates, This is a country that's transforming by tolerance, fraternity, mutual respect, and freedom. He said, I return home with the hope that many deserts of the world can bloom like this. I believe it's possible. What kind of a world do we want to build together? Now, folks, we are, as believers in the Lord, are not trying to build a better world. We know Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is going to come, and he is going to to wipe out the wicked before he starts over with his kingdom and bring us with to him to rule and reign. So we're not trying to build the world to be a better place. Okay, the Pope is, no doubt, and and the Catholic Church has been. Here's what uh, Sheikh... Um, Abdullah bin Syed, the ruler of UAE, said uh, while he was there, he said he has never seen interreligious cooperation at at this level before. And that is a historic visit for a pope to be at that place. So um, I I I found out when I got there, I did not know that he was going to be there. That is one of the newest mosques in the world, if not the newest. It is um, two football fields inside there, nothing but gold and marble. I've been in there on two occasions because I do work over there, as you know. You support me, you pray for me in the Emirates. Um, Pope Francis went in there. Imagine that, a Catholic Pope in one of the biggest and most uh, prestigious mosques in the world. Uh, You know, the world is really advancing. Now, something else I didn't know while I was there is the World Government Summit was there, and the Pope was there to kick it off. The World Government Summit brought together, while I was there, while I took that picture, on that same beach, which is Jumeirah Beach, they met in the Madinat Jumeirah, and this is the most expensive hotel in the world, um, $8,000 a night for the the cheap nights, the cheap rooms, $15,000 if you're a high roller and you want the better rooms. And so 140 countries were represented, including 1,400 or so representatives, and Pardon me? You said 4,000 representatives? Okay, 4,000 representatives from 140 countries. Okay, I didn't get that right then. Um, Anyway, it was a world conglomeration right there on that beach. And uh, and I was there at that time, and and I was just amazed at at some of the statements that were made. Um, The UN President Espinosa was there, and she said, One world government is the only way to solve climate change and save the planet. That was her message. Uh, Anthony Robbins was there, and Anthony Robbins, among other things, said that uh, the, that, um, uh, the UAE had achieved um, a, 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 an equitable wage for everybody. And uh, he, he said, unlike the United States. You know, everybody likes to throw off on the United States, don't, don't they? And uh, the reality is, I work in labor camps, and I know better. I know what those, uh, and, and I know some of them are actually working there, and they don't even get paid. And that guy was just lying. Um, Ariana Huffington was there and spewing some, some nonsense. Um, a former UN uh, chief, um, Ban Ki-moon, was there. The dignitaries of the world were there, and the reason they were there was to advance the World Government Summit, and the pillar of it is climate change. If they can get the world contributing millions and uh, millions, mil- millions is now like a $10 bill, you understand that, right? We're talking billions and trillions. If they can uh, do that, that is their goal to achieve uh, climate change. Well, what I did was baptize believers right there. You can see the, uh, the, the hotel in the background. And I was too dumb to know that the conference was going on, so I just took a group of believers, including the guy on the right is a Muslim that got saved uh, two years ago, and baptized, and then uh, baptized him. And then, uh, again, this this group this year, the the picture you just saw was two years ago, and this was this year, uh, five more guys, um, the leader that uh, is trained in our Bible college in Pakistan is named Adnan, is in the red. And these guys were baptized. Uh, This is just one picture. I have several pictures of baptizing each one. And it was around dusk that evening. 
Uh, they got saved as a result of many of them of a cricket tournament that Adnan organized where he went to the labor camps and he organized teams and they competed and then uh, the gospel was preached by a, a Baptist preacher there uh, that had come in for that uh, purpose and several of these guys had gotten saved uh, at that time. So um, while that was going, while the world uh, uh, some, a government summit was going on, isn't it wonderful to know that Believers were being baptized, including Muslims, and two of these guys, that guy and, and um, the two guys on the, le on the left between Adnan and I were former Hindus, and they, they, they profess Christ as their Savior. So, and also the Muslim guy I showed you from last year, he, right there, he came down just, just to be supportive. So in other words, two years later, he's still growing and serving the Lord, and he came to the baptism just to be supportive of these new guys that were being baptized. So, uh, you know, just a, a phenomenal uh, a privilege to be a able to, to, to be there on a, on a Muslim beach and, and where the world was focusing on world government. And I didn't know it until I left. I, then I started reading about it and knowing about it. But, but God had me there to baptize believers. By the way, while I was baptizing, there was a soccer game going on on the beach, Jemira Beach. Uh, a bunch of Afghans were playing soccer. You say, how do you know they're Afghans? Well, because they were speaking Farsi. That's how, how we knew. Uh, because, you know, people of, uh, of Pakistan, Afghanistan, that area somewhat looked the same. But they were conversing in Farsi as they were playing beach soccer. And uh, so we were able to baptize again. The labor, uh, labor camps uh, are full of people who come from some of the poorest countries on earth, and I've shared this with you before, and uh, they're given a bed to sleep in, food to eat, and bus trip in to go to work in some of the major cities. And they go in jumpsuits like that. They, they live behind the barbed wire. And uh, I've spent years, and you're, well, 15 years now, going every year uh, and preaching behind uh, the barbed wire and the different other labor camps. Uh, this is Adnan, and this is what we do. We, 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 um, we bring people into the um, bunk, bunk houses. Uh, we have permission to do that. And many times, uh, Hindus and Sikhs and some Muslims will come in there. In fact, in this particular meeting, uh, three or four of those guys on the left are Hindus. I know they don't look like it because they just came in from work and, and they've got Western dress on, but uh, th that, that's, they got saved um, from the Hindu faith. Here's another meeting. And uh, this was just a few weeks ago. Um, the young man in the white shirt on the left is Simon. He's trained in our Bible college in Pakistan, and you've done a whole lot for that ministry in Pakistan. I want to share with you a little bit, but he's now over there. So he's now helping Adnan, and uh, he brought all these guys out. His roommates wouldn't let him have a meeting in the bunkhouse, so they said, well, let's take some carpets out in the desert. And so by flashlight, we, uh, they sat on the carpets, and I preached the gospel. Four of those guys to the far end stood and prayed to receive Christ as their Savior that night. And once again, they were from Hindu and Sikh backgrounds. And uh, so Simon is, is beginning a new work in another labor camp. And, and this is a, a man on the, a motorcycle in the blue suit. He's in Pakistan right now. He's one of the graduates of our Bible college. And he is, I'm sending money over this month to get him a visa and, and to, to get him um, uh, over there to also help Simon so that they can team up. You know, the, these are four-year trained in our Bible college, and together they'll form a team over there in the desert, and they will win Hindus and Sikhs. They don't need me to come over there and preach the gospel. These guys are trained. And just like what Kiatisak was saying, when we train the nationals, uh, then all we have to do is encourage them. And, and so please pray. That's Faisal. You, what he's been doing the last two years, he planted a church in Lahore, Pakistan. And I actually preached there two weeks ago. And now he's leaving to go to the Emirates and, and he will work as a laborer. And they, they get very minimal uh, um, uh, uh, pay, but he's willing to do that in order to reach people for the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he'll join with Simon and they'll win several people, no doubt, to the Lord. Well, uh, you've heard me talk about this young man in the T-shirt. You've seen uh, pictures of him before when I've been here. When I first met him about uh, eight years ago now, his name was Ahmed Shah. He's from the border of Afghanistan, uh, the city of Peshawar. And uh, he'd been over there for several years. He started coming to our Bible studies, very Muslim. Uh, Taliban, the, the Taliban uh, was born and, and, and is familiar with that area. The Afghan-Pakistan border is Taliban country. 
Um, and, and most everybody there is either in the Taliban or sympathetic relatives to the Taliban. That's where he comes from. He started coming to our Bible studies. There he is with his the pink uh, um, highlighter in his Bible. His brother is over there to the left. And he got saved. And my, did he get saved. And for several years, every time I would go to that particular labor camp, he'd come an hour early and pepper me with questions. He'd stay an hour late and once again pepper me with questions. And um, what a delightful young man. And then about five years ago, the office of uh, the government office overseeing labor camps called him in and said, we understand you have converted to Christ. Now, for a Muslim to convert to Christ, that is the worst thing that, that, that can happen to Muslims. And so they said, they ripped his, um, his, his visa up, and they said, you are no longer able to work. We're putting you on a plane to go back to Pakistan. You'll never be allowed in here again because you have converted uh, to Christianity. So he went back to his village, and much like you, his, his mother and all of his relatives turned against him. His wife is, is still um, listening to, to the gospel. And, but what happened is he went back and changed his name to John Paul. And many of you have been praying for John Paul. And so I saw John Paul just uh, last week while I was there. And uh, what wonderful fellowship we've had. He is basically on the run from Muslims in his hometown. He's found a job working. Actually, his brother's back in Pakistan. They're working together. He hides out in the back of the shop. He has a little mat that he spreads out on the, on the ground and, uh, in the back of the shop. And he, he, he tries to do background work so the people can't see him. But uh, he's a glowing testimony for the Lord. Here's an older picture of, of another baptism. I, I, I like to put that in because not only is uh, John Paul's brother there in the blue, uh, he's also saved, a saved Muslim, but also the, the bus driver there, the Sikh guy uh, and with his turban. I didn't even know he was there. I started preaching just before I led them into the water to baptize, and I looked to my left, and there's this guy with a turban on, and, 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 and I knew where he came from. He drove the bus, and he was so interested in what we were doing, he wanted to come down, and so he listened to the gospel the whole way. Well, the Lord is doing some mighty wonderful things in Pakistan, and you have been so much a key part of it. That's why I want to keep you so informed about it. Uh, Pastor Asher has been here. How many of you remember? Pat? When, yes, I thought you did. I know you're praying for him. That's him on the right. And so uh, the whole time in Pakistan, we kept busy going to one of these churches. We now have over 20 churches since 2007, 20 Baptist churches. Uh, ten have their own buildings, concrete buildings for the glory of God, many of them costing, uh, you know, $30,000 for the building, $30,000 for land. You helped. The last time I was here, you gave us the money, almost $30,000 to buy land for our 11th. It's already been sent over, and I'll show you the picture of the people are so excited because I'm getting ready. And a friend of mine from Statesville just gave me 20000 just before I left for Pakistan. My home church, Trinity, just a Sunday school class, gave me 4000 So I'm now going to send 25000 over so they can actually begin the construction. You paid for the land, and these others have now paid for the building. But uh, uh, that's amazing what God has done since 2007. So there's uh, 11 established churches over there. The 11th is getting their building. The rest are pretty new church plants. Uh, and what happens is our graduates, many of them that graduate from our Bible college after four years of training, they go out and start churches. And I'll show you where, the kind of places they meet here. But there's John Paul getting baptized. And this is, again, just two weeks ago. Uh, there's Asher in his office there at the Bible college. Um, John Paul came down a 10-hour bus ride from the Afghanistan border so he could be with me for a week. And, oh, we had such sweet fellowship. He's really growing in the Lord. He needs to be where he can. See, he can't go to church. There are no churches in his region. And if, they, if he went to a church uh, and, they found, and Muslims found out, not only would he be killed, but they, would, they could burn the church. Who knows what the Taliban might do? And so he's kind of a fugitive. And oh, was he ever happy to come back to the Bible college where he studied for a year and a half until he endangered the lives of the Bible college. And, and you remember that story, he had to go back. But uh, fellowshipping with him again was wonderful. Uh, there he is around the map. And this is again just a week or two ago. We walked on the roof together. And he doesn't know a lot of English, but we were able to communicate. And uh, so just continue to pray for John Paul. Here's what he told me. He said, um, I have been able to talk to an official from the UAE, Arab Emirates government, who, uh, who knows that I'm blacklisted there, 
And now because of things have changed there, he said, this man is willing to erase that blacklisting of me. Uh, and, and he said he doesn't want any money up front. But he said, when I get the visa and go back there and get the job back that I used to have, he said, you can give me a little bit of money for doing that. But he said, I will take that blacklisting designation. That would be so good because at least over in the United Arab Emirates, he's got friends. He's got people in the labor camp. He can go to a, a service every week, even though he has to be really quiet about it, maybe sneak in, sneak out. There where he's living in Pakistan, uh, he cannot. He has, he has no church near him, and if he did find a, a group of believers, he endangers them just by being there. He sneaks in to see his wife uh, a few times a week. He has three small children. Well, they're not so small anymore. Um, uh, the oldest one is now eight. So um, anyway, just continue to pray for John Paul. Just to show you some of the churches that we built. This one, uh, this is another one. These are all in different cities, as you saw by the map. This guy's in the desert near the Afghanistan border. Uh, uh, th this is Rafiq in the city capital, uh, capital city of Islamabad. Uh, you may have heard of that. This is just a, a recent picture. These three, after I preached, are standing, and I took their picture, and they're praying to receive Christ as their Savior in our, very, in, in our uh, newest church that we just built. I had never seen it before. I went in there, and, uh, the, the, and this is another one. Uh, one of the teachers in our Bible college has, has a church this size. Several of the Bible college students attend this one in the city of Lahore. Um, this, this is an, another um, brand new church that has been established uh, south of Lahore. Now, let me tell you, when I went to go to that church, when I was in Pakistan a year and a half ago, there was mob. You remember, maybe I told you, but they were upset about the, the, um, uh, uh, the Asia Bibi thing that's still smoldering, but they were really upset about that, and they were burning police cars, and they were beating people, and so we were on the way to this church, and we got news uh, over the, the, the radio that uh, roads are being closed, they're, they're there at that particular area, they're uh, burning police cars, they're beating people, and so I was not able to go uh, to that church the last time I was in Pakistan, but now things have cleared up other than what happened at the airport there, uh, but at least there were no demonstrations, there were no police car burnings. There was no anti-government uh, demonstration. So I was able to go to all those churches. Uh, from the roof of that church, uh, I, I just couldn't help but show you how, how right in the middle of farm country, that beautiful church has been established. And the pastor of that church um, has started two other churches. In fact, for about eight years, he pastored three churches. And he is so deserving to, uh, to have a church building for his people. They met outside for eight years. You can imagine if your Sunday service was held outside for eight years. That's quite a bit of dedication. Well, now these people have their own church building. And as I looked over the roof, uh, I couldn't help but I, I thought you'd enjoy seeing how close we are to the, you know, cow, uh, the, the cows and the uh, various other things that those people are doing. Um, this is a church that meets in, in a home on the, on the top floor, uh, the, uh, underneath the roof though, and, and this family, actually it's two or three families combined, they have given over the top floor of their house uh, for this church to meet, and they've been meeting there for five years, and there it is. Uh, and it's packed with people. There must have been about 200. I can't even get them all in the picture. And, uh, and, and this man also teaches at our Bible college. And here's another church that was just started. And it's very, very primitive. But once again, it was packed full of people. These people had, had never ha had a church to go to. And that's the case uh, throughout Pakistan. People who are non-Muslims, but yet they have no church to go to. They're not Muslim, so they think they're Christian, but they don't even know who Christ is. They've never been to church before. So we're busy planting churches. This is a house church. You can see how primitive it is. And they'll meet there for five or six years before we'll even consider uh, helping them with a building because we want that to make sure it's, it's real, and that's what we've done for the other pastors. We're not in a hurry to, to just give out uh, uh, money to build buildings, but uh, this is a brand-new church plant there. Uh, I want to tell you about this. This is a church on the roof. And um, I was preaching there in, in the city of Faslabad, and, and, and once again, just a couple weeks ago. And the Lord just moved on me while I was preaching. Wrap this up. You, you know, sometimes when you're preaching, do you, do you ever feel like the Lord wants you to either move to a different passage or quit? 
Well, this was the message I was getting from the He just said, you need, to, you need to finish, you need to finish, you need to finish. And so I basically finished the passage I was on, and I gave the invitation. One or two people stood, received the, uh, the, the Lord, prayed to receive Christ. And then, just as we were finished, the Muslim called a prayer, and which is unusual at that time in the evening. And I mean, it just drowned out. The whole, when, when, the, when the Muslim called a prayer, it goes over the loud spits like, like this, and it's, ah, 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 and it goes to every minaret and mosque all over the town. They all do it at the same time. You know what? If I hadn't quit when I did, I couldn't have given an invitation. I couldn't have even finished the message of salvation because that would have drowned me out. And I just thought, wow, the, you know, here I am a bit frustrated because I really didn't get to the end of my message that I wanted to, but if I hadn't quit then, those people would not have had the opportunity uh, to be saved. Um, this is another church plant in a city uh, uh, about five, six hours from Lahore. It's a brand new one. I'd never been there before. And uh, all these people are, are being, to, uh, they've been won to Christ. They're, they're solid. The, many of them baptized. The fellow on the left seated in the pink shirt is their pastor, just a recent graduate of two years from our Bible college. And uh, here's another church meeting outside. It, it was cold those nights. And um, again, full of people. And you know, when you preach outside or on the rooftops, the Muslims around hear you because you do have a, a loudspeaker and, and they're allowed to listen to you. They just can't come to your services. So uh, that's a way of getting the gospel out, these open air services. Now, this is the picture I showed you the, la the last time I was here with Asher. And we met out there on the street. They just bought, blocked off a street. This is a church where the pastor, who's on the left there, has been already, uh, the padlock was put on his church on another side of Lahore. You may remember me telling you that. A big sign was put on his church saying, you can no longer meet here, and if you do, we'll beat you or we'll kill you. Do not break this padlock. To this day, that church is still padlocked. And, and so now he's, he, from then on, he started meeting over in this side of Lahore. And look at the crowd he's got now after about four years of church planting on this side of Lahore. And this was just uh, almost two years ago. They were out in a cold night and they blocked off the street for their meeting. Well, this time, they, because of your gift, the last time I was here, they own this property. So now they're able to spread carpets on a property that they own. And, and I'm t I just t got done telling you, 25000 is going this month to start building on that particular property so that they'll now have a church like some of the others you've seen. And uh, once again, I want you to know that you've had a great part, in, in not just in this church, but over the years you have. You support Pastor Asher, and I want you to see that what you're doing is, is having uh, a tremendous effect upon people in the city of Lahore and around, the, uh, and around Pakistan. Well... Sometimes I'm greeted like, you know, your deacons greet you at the door, you know, with a handshake. Sometimes I get uh, deacons greeting me with an AK-47 to take me into the building, like that fellow there. Um, and, and after church in the evening, uh, the pastor's there in the red tie. You can see the guy in the scarf. He's got a gun. And uh, we're, we're traveling through very narrow uh, city streets to go from the, the evening service, which we had. In fact, I, I think I preached a couple hours that night um, on, in a conference. And then we were going to get something to eat at one of the family's homes. And so because of protection, uh, he's escorting me there with his gun. Uh, sometimes I'm just showing you some of the interesting and dangerous things. Um, sometimes you, you come across uh, this in the middle of the night uh, full of hay and it's taken up not only your side of the road but his side too and uh, you have to break because they have no, no lights on. You just, you're just fortunate to see them in time. Uh, sometimes getting to the church is a little bit um, interesting because imagine dri uh, driving your car through these narrow streets but also even just walking uh, into the building because of the mud. That can be interesting. Uh, this is the way some of them travel. This is one of our pastors, and his wife is pregnant, and she's got a baby and no helmet, and she, that's the way they travel through the streets of Pakistan. Um, just amazing what they, what they, that's all they have. They don't have a vehicle, so that's how they uh, get to church and get anywhere they want. And, and Maria is a precious lady. She's pregnant with her, their second child there. But I want you to know there are some conveniences there in, in Pakistan. We're, we're getting McDonald's. 
And as you can see, the, the lady on the left is wearing her um, niqab, her black. All you can see is a slit in her, eye, a slit in her eyes there. But, uh, you, so you can definitely see because of the Urdu writing on it that, that that's... Um, uh, it, but, but the Muslims and, and the, the Pakistani people are loving McDonald's. And so I thought I'd show you that picture there too. Uh, and just briefly, I'm just about to close, but you remember the problems we've had with suicide bombings and the, there's a real police presence on Sundays because at the Catholic Church they blew up over 45 people one day, one Sunday, and injured another 70 or 80 uh, just a few years ago. This is our Bible college and, and I know that you've prayed for that and I know you've given money that, that uh, has helped to build that uh, in 2012 and it's going really, really well. Uh, that vehicle is able to uh, provide that for the students. Here's a typical class that I was teaching uh, for, for a couple weeks uh, there last month. Uh, they do have a bank of computers, which helps them greatly. And, of course, uh, the dangers that we do face there uh, require sometimes my meetings to be guarded, and I won't go into detail. I have another, uh, other times. But folks are very, very poor in Pakistan. Uh, here's a situation of them cooking with cow dung, and I've eaten many, many a meal that way. And just to kind of close off uh, tonight, I think I, I started with that, telling you about the airport situation, how it was closed. But I'm thankful to the Lord that it opened up the night before I was to fly out, and so I was able to get home. If you will just turn in your Bibles, I have about five minutes, uh, Pastor, I lost track of time here. 7.52, do you usually go to about 8? Okay, uh, will you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5? I was uh, just, uh, my heart's been burdened about the coming of the Lord to preach about it. And, and just, you can imagine uh, being over there on the same beach where the world, you know, conf uh, world government summit was being held. Uh, and I didn't know it at the time, but I mean, it just, it just makes me really think about how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 16 to the, to the rulers, religious rulers, he said, look around you. Um, you know, you can tell if it's going to be good weather, if it's going to be bad weather by the, by the color of the sun at night or in the morning. But why aren't you knowing that the signs, I'm the Messiah, I'm here, the prophets have said that I'm here, and you've ignored those signs. Folks, let's not be guilty of ignoring the signs of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. World government is one of those signs, and we're going to look at Revelation 17 here in just a minute. Um, the world religion is one of those signs. The, the, the world powers, uh, the world governments of this world, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, uh, Persia, Greece, and Rome, have all been dominated by world religion as well. And now I believe the seventh, and, and we'll see that in just a minute. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, we have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a, as a thief in the night. And you know, he's just got done chapter 4 talking about the rapture, right? You see the context. I know all of you've, uh, you, you, would, you would know the teaching of the rapture there in chapter 4. So, so really, chapter 5 is just an extension of what he just got done, Paul just got done talking about. And he says it's coming. As a thief in the night, for when they shall say, who is they? That's the world. When the world shall say, they, peace and safety or peace and security. Have you ever known a time when, when the world is so concerned about everybody's peace and safety, where you can't even say anything that, that someone might be offended, then you've, you've, you've infiltrated their peace and safety? I mean, we are living in this time when they shall say peace and safety, when, when the world is concerned about the security of the world, like the World Government Summit, then come a sudden destruction upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren, that's us, believers, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. See, we who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we're waiting on Him. We're looking for Him. We should not be taken off guard by the things that are happening in our world. And then go down to verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. And the, the wrath He's talking about is the wrath of the tribulation period, the judgment of God, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn with me on a final um, little uh, portion of Scripture to Revelation 17. Revelation 17, I've been 
preaching a lot about prophecy uh, lately. Um, it's just been on my heart, and especially with the, the things that are going on in our world. Do you know at the World Government Summit, they had what is called a mind transfer gateway. You know, they not only have speakers, but they have workshops, and then they have displays. And of course, the displays are some of the most um, uh, fascinating, shall I say, things for the delegates to do when they're not listening to a speech. Well, this one display was called the Mind Transfer Gateway. They put a human being next to a a humanoid, a a robot that looks like a human, and they connect brain waves, pulse, they connect everything that that is possible to connect. And and what they are able to do is transfer, uh, they say, part of the mind over to that robot. So, so a, the robot is getting, the robot age is getting beyond just uh, some r- robotic thing that can, yes, no, yes, no, yes, you know, just, just kind of the, the basics. But now it's, it, it, they're, they're starting to develop a thinking process for robotics. And they're doing it by, by, by um, hooking up a, a living person to a robot and s- somehow transferring uh, as much data as they can from their intellect, their mind, their will. Um, and I don't know much more about it, but I, I read about it, that, that that was one of the most interesting displays at the World Government Summit. Um, and I mentioned to you uh, uh, some of the people that were there. Um, the, the world's, uh, they gave a, a trophy out for the world's best minister. They gave it to an Afghanistan man named Dr. Firoz, the Afghanistan health minister. And uh, they gave it to him because he, de- he is d- decreasing infant mortality rates. Um, and he had a great year uh, where Afghanistan's infant mortality rate uh, plummeted. Well, you know, um, he, of course, that's compared to the years when babies were dying of malnutrition. I mean, when the soldiers went into Afghanistan, they found people eating grass. And, of course, Taliban suicide bombings were, were all over the place. And, and so this, this man is now being credited for increasing. But when you think of what they, the infant mortality rates were because of the, the Taliban and the war, it, you know, almost anybody could have an improvement on that is what I'm saying. But uh, anyway, so these, these are some of the kind of things uh, that they're doing. And while they're uh, honoring a man for the infant, uh, for decreasing the infant mortality rate. Look at what we're doing over here. We're we're having babies that are actually born on the table, and doctors and mothers are deciding, well, should we live, let that one live, or let that one die? Do uh, you understand the kind of world we're mixed up world we're living in here? But uh, they're trying to solve all these world problems. But you know, Revelation chapter 17 speaks about the beast who is going to be the world ruler, and he's going to come out of a world government. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the beast is described, verse 8, that the, the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. You see, he is assassinated, and his, he goes down to the bottomless pit like any uh, sinner or satanic individual, uh, but then he comes out of that pit. And I believe Satan himself actually inhabits the body for the last three and a half years of the beast of Revelation. And uh, notice, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. You know, that's written there as well as in Revelation uh, 16, talking about the, the followers of the beast whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. When they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, which in the book of Daniel speaks of kingdoms. Daniel 2. Uh, remember the great stone that came down that smashed the kingdoms of the world and then went on in verse 44, Daniel 2, 44, to become the kingdom that filled the earth, which was the kingdom of the ancient of days. So the seven heads are seven mountains or kingdoms upon which the woman sitteth. Now the woman, and again, I don't have time to develop it, but I know your pastor has preached about it. You read about the woman in verses 1 through 7, and it looks very familiar with the world religion that has been existing since almost the days of the apostles. World religion. And now you see it uh, getting close to not only Buddhism and Hinduism, but now Islam is now being brought into this world religion. And we know from verse 18 that that woman, which speaks of world religion, is a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. We know it's a city that has embassies in all the nations of the world, that has a vote in the United Nations, that, that desperately hates Israel. 
That's the world religion that's being formed under our eyes. And all I'm saying is, let's look around us. Let's look at the signs. The world government is forming. The world religion is forming. Now go back to verse 10. And there are seven kings. Well, of course, kings sit on kingdoms. Kings rule over kingdoms. Five have fallen. In other words, there's been five world kingdoms in history. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece. The sixth one is Rome. All established world kingdoms of history. Now it says, and, um, and the other is, or one is, in other words, while John was writing, the Roman kingdom was still there. Uh, the Romans ruled the world at the time John was writing. So one is, that's the sixth one. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, that king that represents the next world kingdom or the seventh one, he must continue a short space. And, verse 11, the beast that was and is not, that's the assassinated one that is, I believe, resurrected by the power of Satan and indwelt by Satan, he, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So, the seventh kingdom is yet to come. It still isn't here. But when I think about what's happening in, as far as how much the world is ready for that seventh world kingdom, how that they're already calling their, their efforts the World Government Summit. And by the way, this isn't the first year. This is the seventh annual World Government Summit, but it is now being thrust into everybody's minds to where uh, we're, we're seeing even over here in America, uh, some of the people that are uh, our politicians are plugged into that kind of thinking. World Government Summit and climate change being the the the... the the wheel that rolls that into power. Uh, and, and it's not just about, I mean, our climate is changing. We understand uh, the second law of thermodynamics, everything degenerates, including the spin of the earth and everything else. But we're, we're the, 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 the idea of uh, the world government exploiting climate change to redistribute wealth from the nations that, that, are, uh, that have um, to, uh, to, to making a, a, a world government. And Five have fallen, one is, the other's not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. In other words, there's going to be a seventh world government. They're already planning it. I believe it's right after we leave. And then out of that seven, the eighth is the beast. And he will overthrow that world government, and he will be the ruler. He will force people to take his mark. You will not be able to buy or sell, according to Revelation 13. That's how it's all going to happen. And now we're seeing with the presence of the robots, uh, because we know that in chapter 13 that, that, that uh, the beast is going to set an idol of himself that will speak and will, will have a database so he'll know who's got his mark and who doesn't, and, and it'll be a lifelike robot. We are seeing things that are happening in our day that are amazing. And I just wanted to share those things with you from a, 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 someone who has just been there and realized what, what is happening uh, in a country that... Uh, one of those Gulf countries that used to be so pro-Islamic terrorism is now embracing world religion, embracing world government, and people are fawning over this country, United Arab Emirates, and telling everybody what a, what a great pioneering uh, Muslim country this is. That's pretty indicative that that may be the final barrier for the world government to really come together. So... I just wanted to share those things, and I trust that you'll continue to uh, pray for John Paul, pray for these other converts, Hindu converts, Muslim converts. That's what we're doing. Buddhist conference uh, converts in the case of Kiatasak. We're trying to win as many people to the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days, and we're doing it by training uh, the nationals so that they can go across borders, so they can go into these countries that we cannot go and live and work in. So thank you for your vision and burden uh, for missions. Amen, Brother Mark. Enjoyed that. Uh, I sort of sit there and feel ashamed. Their dedication, their study, their time. And it gets 8 o'clock in the Baptist church. We go, boy, when is he going to get done? I don't think you're like that, but a lot of people do. Uh, listen, you take for granted that everybody on Wednesday night is saved. And I like the way you do it over there. Let them sit down. Give the invitation for anyone that's not sure they're saved. Let them stand up. I like that. It might be something different to consider. What do you think? Yeah. Stand up. If you're not ashamed, stand up for the Lord, you know. Amen. That's good. That's good. Thought-provoking, Brother Mark. I like to hear stuff like that and just think about it and realize 
Uh, we are towards the end. I was reading today, I was supposed to be bring, bring a message on the millennial reign of Christ on Sunday, but I'm, I'm not able to get out of Revelation 19 yet. And interesting when you yoke up the Muslims and the Catholics, and Brother Mark's being politically correct here, he didn't want to call it the Catholics out there. But when you yoke them up, you have the Pope as described in Revelation 17 very clearly. When you come to Revelation 19, you see the compromise between the Muslims and the Catholics to form that one world uh, religion. And that is that the saints there in Revelation 19 that's uh, standing before the throne have had their heads cut off. That sort of mixes them together a little bit, doesn't it? The Muslims like to cut people's heads off, don't they? So that'd be interesting, you know. But hey, good news, we won't be here, right? Amen. I'm glad I'm a pre-trib. Not an oh, trib or a post-trib. But anyway, enjoy that? Say amen. 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 Well, someone's <laughs> already given some money towards uh, Brother Mark and uh, Pastor with us tonight. Let's do this. If you'd like to give some towards Brother Mark, you've always been good and given to whatever ministry he lays on, God lays on his heart. Um, I'd like to give some personally. I normally just say let's give some from the church. Uh, you understand a month ago when we gave um, money to uh, Brother Green's over in uh, um, Africa, South Africa, he was just so grateful that the president of the organization sent us a letter thanking us for that. And he put your name in their next newsletter. and says, thank Charity Baptist Church for buying one of those $3,000 rooms for them. And so um, I'd like to pray and ask God in our heart what to give. And then if um, any of you men want to, deacons and all want to get together and talk about any extra gift, it's okay. I know we keep on giving and giving, but... It's like that old battery. What is that battery, that walk, that rabbit that walks around? You, it just keeps on going. It gives and gives and it keeps on giving. So y'all pray about what to do and pray pray for them. We're, we're spoiled in America. You agree? We're spoiled. And I, I see how they sit and on their knees and worship for hours. And Eddie Wang, when he was here some years back from the underground church in China, how people would get on their knees in a little room and It'd be packed from wall to wall, and they'd stay there six, seven hours studying the Bible. And uh, I wouldn't be good if Christians just say, let's learn, let's learn, let's learn. Let's, let, let's come to Sunday school. Let's learn all we can learn about the Word of God. That sure would be good. Brother Mark, we appreciate you coming, buddy. Um, you pray about what to give. Give from your heart. And uh, some of you men want to get together and talk. If you want to give anything extra, you know me. I'm, whatever you want to give, I don't care. You know, the Lord giveth, and He give it away, and He gives it back, right? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's all stand. That way you can reach and get your billfold better, and uh, easier to get your checkbook out. No, hey, I don't have to ask you people to give. You've always given very good. Let's ask the Lord to bless Brother Mark, our pastor here, and his wife. And ask God to lay on our heart what to give them, okay? All right. Precious Father, we do bow. We thank you for while what we saw tonight is sort of shocking, Lord. We know we're coming to the end of this old world. We know, Lord, that we have it so good in America. My, my heart goes to America, to our churches. We could do so much more. We could be better witnesses, Lord. We could study the Bible more. We could spend more time with you. And I pray that we will and a desire to reach out to others. And Lord, as we give tonight, let us give as if we were given to someone that's trying to reach one of our children that's unsaved. So let us think about that, Lord. And so let us give from our hearts. And then, God, we know that as we give, every person that comes to know Christ if we give with the right motive, we'll have part in those precious folks. And what a great day that will be. Now, Lord, guide us, direct as we give, as you lay in our hearts what to give for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all come and chat with Brother Mark and with the family. And Johnny's standing in the back, back there with an um, offering plate. And we don't have any AK-47s, but we do have a lot of people that pack in this 